Thank you. Thank you for joining us. If you're in Tahoma, too, you are in the right place. You are here to see me. Andrew Taylor, with the benefits of testing and automation. Andrew works as a developer programs engineer at Pantheon, consulting with their agency partners on complex workflows and automation. In his presentation today, he hopes to share the benefits he has seen as a result of teams adopting automation and encourage you to automate parts of your workflow as well. Thank you for coming. So yeah, talking about benefits of testing and automation, A. Taylor, Emmy on GitHub and Twitter, I tweeted out the link to the slides, so if you want to follow along, grab the resources at the end, please do that. Uh, I came up from Portland, so I love the Northwest, and being outdoors, hiking, uh, mountain biking, and all these sorts of things. Um, but more than working at Pantheon, and you know, being a human who likes to be outside, I am a maintainer of websites, as most of us are here at WordCamp Seattle. And so that means that, you know, I'm building websites in my day job, but also my dad's company needs a website, and he says, can you refer an agency knowing darn well that I'm going to end up building it myself? <laughs> and I'm going to go uh, find an agency, right? So uh, these are the sorts of things that happen. We pick up these projects, and we have to maintain all of them over time. Um, whether they're personal projects or client projects. So I want to talk today about testing and automation and really look at ways that we can improve how we're maintaining websites and improve our workflows. Uh, and changes, especially if it's a client active project, right, happen frequently. We get requests from the client, that might be change this template. We have security updates that have to be run all the time. Big WordPress 5.0 update coming, I bet every single plugin you have installed is going to have an update that goes along with that. Bug fixes, new features, we're developing, all these sorts of things uh, are coming in. And so, who uses a staging server? So, yeah, hopefully we all do. We shouldn't be cowboy coding in production anymore. Um, because we don't want to break the live site, especially if it's a client site where uh, getting paid for that, that work can't go down. And Usually the workflow I see when I interact with folks who are using a staging server is that they have this new feature, this bug fix, all of these things, and people are maybe doing it locally, maybe they're working uh, right on the staging server, but everyone pushes their changes up, and then they do around the QA, right? So you have this bug fix, this new feature, all these plugin updates, and they're all on the staging server at the same time, and now we have to uh, do this QA. And, you know, if people are a little bit more advanced, maybe using version control, we do that work on different Git branches. Um, so maybe developer A and developer B, uh, our new feature and our plugin updates are on different branches. But, again, they both kind of look good on my local machine or wherever I'm doing the work, and then I push it up to the staging server. And so we have this spot where we're doing this large amount of QA with multiple changes uh, coming into play. And so just thinking about the scenario where we're updating uh, plugins and themes, right? So this is one sort of change that maybe that QA looks something like this, that I'm going to go take a look at the live site. Um, I'm going to go take a look at the staging site. If I'm feeling fancy, I'll load them up side by side. Maybe I'll go check mobile because mobile is really important, um, right? And we want to make sure that that's looking good. So who noticed what was different, right? There actually was a change there when I ran these updates between the uh, staging site and the live site, and it's the search box. Um, more specifically, we can see uh, the live site's on the right, the uh, staging site's on the left, and we can see that the label search got added in addition to the icon, which is not a big deal. Um, but you might not be able to notice is that the actual search button is a little bit off. Uh, it's kind of running into the border on the bottom there, and as a human, just looking at these things side by side, this is something I missed. I didn't notice that. Maybe you have an OCD client who does notice that it's running over the border, right? Um, so, and that's just the home page of one site, and now we have to repeat this for all the different templates we need to check, 
maybe a single post, maybe an archive page, maybe the contact page, whatever, and we're doing this over and over um, every time we run updates. So this is just one type of QA. And if we have the staging site where it's not just plugin updates, but the new template, the bug fix, the client request, all these things are stuffed on the staging server. We're doing this QA, it doesn't always go well, right? We catch things. And then we have to find and fix these things. Um, and we're probably out of time because at this point, the client wants their request to go live, they want the bug fix, we're at the end of a sprint where we need to get this stuff out there, but now we have to untangle and figure out where was the issue, uh, maybe it's holding up all of these other changes. <sighs> There's got to be a better way, right? So this is what I usually see. Um, people have a staging site. It's great that we're using that, that we, did, we didn't used to, and that's sort of um, a standard of best practice there, but there's a better way than shoving everything on the staging site, doing this big stressful QA because it's stressful for you. It's also stressful for your client because they have those deadlines. And so you can test after every change. And this is uh, the idea of continuous testing. So we looked at you know staging server that maybe if you're doing a more advanced workflow, you're working in Git branches or things for each change, but you actually need to test um, at each point after every change. So I run plugin updates. I test things. I fix a bug. I test things. I you know, develop a new feature or new templates or whatever. I test things. And then when we get to the point where we're doing the big QA before we go to production, it's a lot less stressful. It's a lot less time consuming because if there were issues, um, like with that search bar after plugin updates, I would have caught it back here. And then I can go in and actually, all right, maybe I created, uh, I created a backup before I ran all those updates. I tested, there were issues. I can restore the backup. I can update the plugins one at a time. I can find where the issue was rather than getting all the way to the end and trying to untangle that mess later. And so this continuous testing sounds great in theory, but checking things is boring. I actually, um, talking with other developers, there's a difference between checking and testing. And if I'm fixing a bug with the menu, I don't mind testing that the menu works correctly. But going and checking everything else on the website, making sure that every template looks okay, that uh, boot, booting up a VM to go check Internet Explorer, or going in and you know looking at all different templates, or filling out the contact form, adding products to the cart, so if I have this quick fix that takes me like five minutes for the menu, going in to check every other part of the website is too much to ask. But we should be doing if we want to catch uh, issues early and fix them before it gets to be a tangled mess. And it's also really time consuming. A lot of people I talk to don't do this in practice. They know they should be doing a more thorough QA more often, but it's so time consuming that it's just not practical uh, because you need to actually be doing the work, not just checking the work. Your clients, um, it's hard to send them a line item for you know five hours of QA when you also have five hours of, of they're like, wait, what? Um, I'm paying you to work. So can we test more often without doing more work? So I started asking this question. Uh, and the answer is to make the robots do the work. If they can actually serve lunch, um, I think this is in Japan, then, you know, they're going to be driving our cars and all of these things. Surely they can help us with our QA. And there are lots of great tools out there, um, tons of tools that exist to help with this. Maybe some of you have used WP CLI, right, to automate parts of your workflow. Um, go in and I want to just check if updates are available or I want to install a plugin. Well, if there's tools like this where we can do these things at the command line, then we can start writing scripts and we can start building up towards this automation. Uh, it is an upfront time investment to learn these tools and write these scripts and get this process going, but it results in this consistent testing practice um, that is going to have long-term benefits, and we're going to get to those benefits. And this is actually one of my favorite comics, right? It kind of helps me get in the mindset of what developers want to do. Uh, pass the salt 20 minutes later. 
I'm building something that will make it so I never have to pass salt to you again, right? Um, and that's what we're going to be doing with our QA, is looking at how can we put the time in upfront to make sure we never have to worry about it. And it is the road less traveled, so most people are still doing things manually. We know that uh, this automation exists, and you might go and look at you know, some sites that are really large scale, like Amazon, right? They're deploying changes so often with such a big team that they can't do it manually. They, they have to have automation. Um, but for us, where the projects we're working on maybe aren't that scale, but we can still take some of those best practices and adopt it. So it's kind of hit at that enterprise uh, tier, and so it's a bit of the, low, the road less traveled because it's you know, kind of this upper echelon, but there's no reason that the rest of us can't take advantage of these things. So looking at uh, our plugin updates again, I want to talk about visual regression testing. And this is what I recommend most people use to kind of cut their teeth on automated testing. So, Visual regression testing uh, is really neat. It will go in, use a headless browser. If you didn't know this, Chrome actually has a headless mode, so I'm running Chrome right now, but it can actually view a web page and not display it on the screen. Um, it's just parsing the HTML, right? So it can go in, uh, do that, and rather than display it on the screen, it can save a screenshot, and then it can go in and check the live site, take screenshots of that, take screenshots of your staging site. Um, and this is the things we're doing manually, pulling these up and comparing them side by side and figuring out the difference. There's no reason that a uh, machine can't do this. And so there's a tool called Backstop.js that helps you automate this process. And so actually, um, I built a little note app that uses Backstop.js, and we can just run it. So I put it in a list of a couple of sites, I pick the one I want to run test for, and I already have the URL of my live site and my staging site saved, and it is actually opening instances of Chrome, looking at the pages I've defined, different viewports I've defined for you know desktop, mobile. So this process that we used to do manually, and even if it only took me 10 minutes, 10 minutes of work after every single change I make, is still a big burden. But now, if I can just pop open my terminal and run the script, and it took less than a minute, generates this nice report, if I actually go in and click, it's showing me uh, the difference, and here's where it found. I'm not spending even the mental energy to do that anymore. All I'm doing is reviewing the report and going, look, okay, before, after, uh, looks like that might be a little bit off. I need to go tweak some CSS. I know that it's on this template in this spot. So rather than wasting my time and energy trying to find the needle in the haystack that may or may not be there, let the tool do that. I just do the analysis and make the decision of is this acceptable or not. And uh, maybe it is. Maybe it finds a difference, but it's an acceptable one, and then you deploy the update anyway. And so that does make it feasible for us to get to that point where we're testing after every change. Uh, because I can run updates, or I can fix the menu, and if I don't have to do all that other stuff manually, that's gonna take a good chunk of time, if I can run a script and kind of automate that process, then we can do it on every change, catch the bugs early, uh, and fix them before we get this giant staging server with 20 things in it, and we don't know where the issue is. So, let's kind of keep going down this path. Um, we use version control, hopefully, uh, using version control on your projects. GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, tons of them out there. If you're still, if you're uh, submitting items to WordPress.org or working with WordPress core, unfortunately you're still using SVN, but whatever it is, uh, hopefully you're using version control. And there are actually continuous integration uh, providers that will help you um, map these scripts and this automation to your version control, which is really great. Uh, so Bitbucket has their pipelines, GitLab has their own, you can use CircleCI. It doesn't matter which one you use, you know, go check them out, um, figure out which one's good, a good fit for you. But they're all pretty similar in what they do. So here was my ideal workflow that I thought up in my head. And I was actually able to use these tools. They have a configuration file that you define 
these are the things I want to do, this is the order I want to do them in. Um, and you write those scripts, and it takes care of actually writing them. So we can do things like build production assets. If you're writing SAS, and that needs to be compiled to CSS, you might be using Grunt or Gulp or something locally. Instead of doing that on your own, now that can be offloaded. You just send your SAS files to GitHub, CI server runs, you, you know, give it the command to compile your SAS files, and it runs it automatically. Uh, it can handle deployments. So you can send your files to your staging server with Git, SSH, SFTP, whatever that is. You can automate that, and this is actually a screenshot here from one of my GitHub repos, where then I call back to the GitHub API and post a link to where it's been shipped. So now, when I open a pull request, I don't have to even log in uh, to the Pantheon dashboard and spin up a new environment. It's happening automatically. So taking these things that we're spending time on and automating them. I added the visual regression testing so that every PR um, comes in. This actually pull request was a request to change the color of the sidebar. So it detected um, that that's where there was a visual difference. That's fine. Um, visual regression does have its limits, though. So if you're working with dynamic content, maybe a banner that rotates, an ad that changes on every page, there are ways to ignore those, but then you're not testing against them. And if your ads aren't working, that probably is an issue. Uh, so it still saves you time that you don't have to go template to template, and it will catch. I think of it as like, um, a big net, you know, it's going to catch most things, but some stuff's going to slip through. Uh, but you can add more tests on top of that. So there's tons of other tests. You can run browser tests, unit tests, performance tests, tons of things. Basically, you want to add enough automated tests that you're comfortable when they all pass, you're not going to get that phone call at 2 a.m. Um, whatever, think of those mission critical things. So for a nonprofit, that might be their donation form. What is that thing that's most important? Um, or we talked about ads. So have visual regression as a nice baseline, but then figure out what's business critical to that site and test those things. For an e-commerce, it's probably that checkout works. And a visual test is not going to tell you if the shopping cart's broken. Uh, so you do have to add a few more tests on top of that, but visual regression gives us a nice baseline that if something is fundamentally wrong with the site, it's probably going to show up in a visual way. Uh, and then we can test for other things that might not show up in that way. And then I looked at other things I was doing manually, um, like examining performance. And I would only do this when there were, you know, performance issues. I need to go in and debug. Well, there's a tool called Lighthouse. You may or may not be familiar with it uh, from Google. It's built into Chrome, but they also have a standalone package you can run. And it will audit your site and give you scores for things like accessibility, SEO. It also does one for performance. So instead of me manually opening the URL, going into my dev console, looking at this network trace and trying to figure out if the site's performant, that's not feasible for me to do after every change. Maybe it's part of that QA we're doing right before we go live, but again, if we catch issues there, it's too late. Uh, so now, I can just run this Lighthouse tool, and it will tell me a performance score. So start thinking of ways you can wrap that into your workflow. In my case, it's when I open a pull request, I'm going to run the performance report against the live site and the code that's in the pull request, and look at the difference. And if the performance score decreases more than 5, I fail the test. Because uh, I want to make sure that any code I'm introducing doesn't make the site less performant. And this is what um, the continuous integration kind of UI looks like. They have, you know, we'll show you a roll-up view. You can go in and click on individual jobs. Uh, but I have things like, I'm going to build the site. I'm going to run code sniffing and unit tests. I'm going to deploy it. I'm going to do my visual tests and lighthouse tests. Um, you, def again, define all these things. You still are going to have to put in the work to write those tests and write the scripts. But once you set it up, then it's always there. Uh, and tests that pass allow you to merge the PR, and tests that fail will actually block a pull request. And I don't know about you, but um, it might be working on your own projects. You know these things you should be testing, 
that maybe you have some internal QA checklist that says go check these templates, go run a performance test, go do whatever. Well, what happens when you're really busy and you bring in a contractor? Are, is the code they're submitting going to go through that same QA process? We all work in open source software. I work on a lot of open source projects. As a contributor to somebody else's project for the first time, I probably don't know what I should be testing on that project. But I love when I open a pull request on a project and I see something like this, and all the check marks are green. I know, as a contributor, that the code I'm sending is not introducing errors. They know, as a project maintainer, that the code they're accepting is not introducing errors. And nobody had to go do the work to figure it out because we've made the robots do that work. And it happens on every single PR, so you get that consistency. And so it makes it feasible to get to that point where we're doing continuous testing with every change. Because now if we open a pull request and that whole suite of tests run automatically, we don't have to spend dev time on it, and we're going to catch those bugs and those issues earlier. We're going to be able to resolve them before we get to that point of, hey, we're going to do final QA on the staging server before launch. It takes all the stress and all the worry out of that because every piece of code that's gone in has already passed this uh, list of tests. You're just doing one final run to make sure things are good before you go live. And so I've helped a lot of agencies and developers kind of improve their workflow with automation, and I want to talk about some of those benefits. So definitely reduce overhead is the biggest one. If you're spending human hours doing something, and you can not spend human hours doing that, you can reallocate those to things that are more billable, more valuable. Our time is better spent actually writing the code than uh, going and running browser tests or performance tests or whatever. You get consistency. It might be that you have a senior developer on your team and they're really proficient with opening up uh, you know, dev tools and running a network stack trace and figuring out where the performance issues are. We might have a junior dev who's not as comfortable doing that. And your QA list that everyone runs through says performance test, theirs might not be as thorough. But if you actually automate that test and make it happen on every time, regardless of who makes the pull request, then your QA process is consistent. And it's not, oh, I forgot to check this template, or I didn't test this as thoroughly as I should have because I'm running out of time. Everything is happening on every single change. And that mitigates a lot of risk. If we're testing early and we're testing often and we're doing this more full stack QA on every single code change, then there is less risk that that final QA process is going to turn up issues. And that gives confidence to you, to your clients, to everyone working uh, on the project and involved in the project. And you get reliable communication. If we think back to that pull request that has stats on this is the performance. It's not just the person, uh, if you're doing QA manually, maybe I document that somewhere, maybe I don't. If we have internal checklists and someone's doing a review, they go in, it passes, they merge the thing. Did anyone write down what that score was? Whether, you know? So uh, have that reliable communication and things are documented because we're um, actually having that happen in the audience. So now I want to go back to our update process and think a little uh, deeper about that and how can we take some of this automation because doing it on pull requests is great. Um, we're going to catch bugs earlier, we're going to catch it more often and a lot of people stop there and I wanted to push it a little further and think about how else can we utilize this and solve like WordPress updates is something we all spend a lot of time doing. Uh, and honestly, I have demo sites and other sites. If I'm here speaking at WordCamp, I'm not logging into my sites to check for updates today. Maybe there's a security update that probably should go out today. Um, so how can I better handle that situation? And so our WordPress update steps is first thing, check, right? Are there even updates available? Um, and if there's not, then you know, we can just let the client know, hey, you're on a maintenance plan. We're checking for updates, just a reminder. Uh, if there are updates available, then create a new Git branch, using version control, create a new environment, apply those updates, 
and we're going to do our visual check, and then we're going to test those critical items like the donation form or the shopping cart or whatever. Um, and so these are things that I log in and I have to actually go do these things. And then if I find issues after I run updates like our uh, search icon there, then I have to go in and, and fix those issues. But if everything looks good when I'm going to do my QA, um, then you know I can merge the code and I can actually deploy those updates uh, and maybe I alert my colleagues in Slack that, hey, I updated the site. And then this red box, this is kind of where you run into dread and some issues is now I have to repeat that for all sites. Let's say I have five. That doesn't seem too bad. I have to log into five sites and do this stuff every day. What happens if you manage a dozen, 50, 100, right? It does not scale very well. Uh, in thinking about WordPress updates, Modern software actually auto-updates, and this was interesting to me, because if you use, you know, Dropbox or Chrome or Slack or whatever, I don't know what version of Chrome I'm running, it just kind of updates and, and things are good. Uh, and that's great for security and functionality, you're always getting the latest, greatest stuff, keeping it secure. WordPress has automated updates in core, um, but there's some issues with that. Uh, your site has to be writable in production, and it's just gonna update, there's no QA process. So even though minor updates are not super risky for breaking things, there could be issues. But the bigger thing for me is plugins and themes are not updated, which WordPress updates don't happen as often as plugins and themes. It seems like every time I log into my site, there's a plugin or a theme update. And so, we need to automate those updates, uh, but we also need to test them. We can't just, you know, click update all and cross our fingers in production, right? That's the whole reason we have staging servers and we're testing things is we don't want to break the production site. So we kind of need the best of both worlds, is we need automatic updates, but we also need to apply the automatic testing to make sure that those updates went well. So if we look at this process, this thing we are doing manually, of actually spinning up a new grant and environment, applying updates, doing a visual check. Well, we've kind of seen that these tools exist for a lot of these things. If I want to check for updates, I can use WPCLI, and it will tell me if I have updates. I can use WPCLI to run the updates. The visual check, we just saw that with the visual regression testing tool. We can automate that. Um, there are other tests you can add for those business critical pieces. And so if we get to the point where we can automate all of these steps. Uh, now, repeat for all sites is not that bad because automation scales. Guess what? Instead of me logging into each site and doing this process manually, it might take me hours. If I totally automate it and let the robots handle this work, they can test every single site in my portfolio at the same time. It can scale out uh, horizontally, so whether I have five sites, 50 sites, 100 sites, it doesn't matter to me, because they're all being tested um, at the same time. It's, we define these steps, and then it, it'll just run them on uh, whatever site we tell it to. And so I actually have had this running in production for over a year, um, outlining those steps. The steps I just outlined, automated them. I post the results back to Slack. And we can actually uh, go look. Here's my Slack channel. This is on a cron running every four hours. It goes through uh, the sites that I'm responsible for maintaining. Applies updates if they're available, runs all the tests. And here's one that failed. Um, so I just get a link to the report. And now my job is not going in and checking for updates and trying to hunt down issues. My job is to go in and if the tests do find something, uh, to go look at it. And so this, um, here we can see this changed, that the spacing around this gallery uh, and these images changed. And this was probably a Gutenberg update, right? There's, uh, I'm running Gutenberg on the site to test out the plugin. They're up really coming out with a release about every two weeks. And so now all I have to do is make the decision about whether the spacing change is acceptable or not. If it is, I just log in and click accept uh, updates and it moves on to deploying them. If it's not okay, then I can go in and update the CSS 
and get that spacing back to where it was previously. And then I just log in, click the button, and tell it to continue. Uh, and it will deploy with my um, fixed CSS. And if all the tests pass, I just get this nice green message that says, hey, updates were deployed for this site, FYI. And so, the hours and hours and hours I was spending uh, doing this, I can now spend doing other things. More valuable work, consulting with our clients, um, building demos, all these things that, you know, Pandian is really paying me to do that work, not to log into a bunch of WordPress sites. That's not the most valuable thing I can be doing. And so, to summarize, uh, adopting automation, we need to test on every change to really catch things and not have that stressful QA period. It's not feasible to do that manually. It just doesn't scale. But we can automate those things. That automation does scale. Uh, it's upfront work to do that, but you're enforcing those rules and you're gonna get that consistent testing every single time. And I really do believe that the long-term benefits are gonna outweigh the learning curve and the setup you're gonna have to do to get this going. Um, because once it's up and running, you kind of set it and forget it. And uh, all of these things we talked about, just to recap of the benefits, the biggest one for me is that people on teams who have adopted automation are happier, right? Nobody's happy manually opening up dev tools and auditing performance. I mean, maybe, but if you have to do that times 30 sites, like every other day, no one wants to do that. So offloading that mundane kind of repetitive work uh, from your developers, allows them to do the work that they really want to be doing. And having a happier, healthier team with a better workflow, I think makes it all worth it. And I do kind of want to end with automation is a journey. So it took me, I've had this running for over a year, but it also took me over a year to build this uh, kind of automated update process. And so I started with, you know, just writing a script that had WPCLI commands that would go into a site, check for updates, um, and apply them, and then I did the QA. And then I learned about visual regression. I'm like, well, maybe I can automate that visual testing. And things didn't always go well. Um, I had it set up and I was like, sweet, visual test passed, I can ship this. Well, it turns out uh, the performance went down like 20% on site. And I shipped that um, because I thought, I automated all my QA. Well, no, I didn't. Um, I automated the visual piece. So it takes a while to build up enough tests that you can be confident when they all pass that you know nothing's gone wrong. Um, so definitely it's a journey. Start automating one piece. So if you automate the visual test, maybe you're still testing the donation form or the shopping cart manually, but you can do that because now you're not spending time doing the visual checking, uh, right? And then with those that time you're saving, invest in more automation, and it kind of just snowballs to the point where you've automated large amounts of your work. I do have some resources here. Uh, so I have an example repository with the auto updates. That's on GitHub. It's tied to Pantheon because the sites I maintain are on Pantheon. You will probably have to do some tweaking to get it working somewhere else. But all the visual testing, the WPCLI commands to run updates, all those things are there. Uh, and then the automated workflow example. This is the one where you open a pull request on GitHub and then it runs a suite of tests, does, you know, builds a site, does deployment, all of those things. Um, and just some tools I generally found useful as I started exploring this stuff and some blog posts. My favorite one on this list is probably uh, Carl Alexander's TwigPress, you might know him as. Um, he has a great post on getting started with like CI and automation for WordPress. It's definitely worth reading. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Again, Nate Taylor and me tweeted out the slides. There's a link, and we have plenty of time for some questions. If you have one, please come up to the mic. That way, it gets onto the recording.
these, these allow. It's not allowed. Is it? Oh, okay. Bang on, bang on. Um, so is it possible to, to visual regression test individual blocks rather than entire pages? Because like if you have a, a, a you know a, an error in a in a login block and it's going to affect the whole rest of your page, you don't really need to you know see all that purple. You just need to see the purple in the one thing that changed. Is it possible to like I guess maybe in conjunction with pattern library uh, test those things individually? Yeah, so uh, the tool I like is called Backstop.js. It uses headless Chrome and Puppeteer under the hood, but rather than running some like crazy headless Chrome commands yourself, you define a config file. Um, and actually, I can just show you what my config file looks like. Uh, so you define things like, you know, we can delay before we take screenshots. Um, my acceptable threshold is 0.1, so if the visual difference is more than 0.1%, it fails the test. Um, but I can go in and define uh, different scenarios and things, and one item you can do here is selectors. So I'm selecting the document, which is the entire page. You can select by a specific div ID, for example. So if you wanted to do a visual test of just one component, as long as you have a CSS selector that can get at it, then you can definitely do that. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, my question is not directly related to you know what you talked about today, but in general, uh, what I find is that um, doing uh, using a staging server with WordPress and doing uh, Regression testing is kind of com it's complicated by the fact that you have both code in you know, PHP, yep. you also have a lot of configuration information in the database itself. And uh, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about what you consider best practices, in particular with the issues that are inside the database, because you know, on staging uh, database, for instance, you have to set the links. You have a uh, plugin you might have configuration parameters that are in there, and you can't, how do you then uh, release them, you know, those little pieces that aren't part of the data and, um, uh, inside the, uh, the data? Do you understand my question? I do, but the, the tests really don't care where the issue is. So if an issue is, I forgot a semicolon in PHP, or the issue is a, a setting is incorrect in a plugin, the tests are just going to alert you that something's wrong. That, that I understand. I'm more asking about the process of actually syncing. You know, because it sounds like what you you talked about here is mainly pushing the code. Mm -hmm. How do you push configuration stuff and adjust the database to make this automated process work? Whether you're doing it manually or not. Yeah, so with updates, um, I'm typically not changing plugin settings. Like, I don't update a plugin and then go in and tweak all its connect, right? I just run the update. Uh, if you are making a larger change and you need to get the database changes from your staging site to your live site, that's just a tough issue in general. There's lots of people that have tried to solve this kind of syncing and haven't been able to do it. There are like use advanced custom fields, for example. They have a feature where you can export the configuration to JSON files, and then you can commit it to version control, you can deploy it along with your code, and then, <coughs> excuse me, when you get to the live site, you just import from that JSON. Um, so I hope that more plugins and things in WordPress go that direction, um, that you can you know get items from the database but actually uh, out into code, that way you can deploy them. But unfortunately for the large part of WordPress, that's not the case. And you can't just shove your entire database from staging to live because you know you don't, can't, don't want to overwrite your uh, live instance. So. so in your case, in your staging database, what, what, what is in there and how do you keep it like in sync with the, with the, with the production database? So typically um, what I'll do is, as part of the, the process, is copy the production database back down to the staging. Um, but then, you know, if I have a plugin that 
I don't know, it's uh, an e-commerce site, and then I need, if I'm going to test the card checkout, I need to switch, switch it to test mode, you define those steps. So we copy the production database over, I know these are the things that I need to change, I'm going to make sure that this plugin is in test mode, or this, and you just define those parameters, make sure that that option is updated before you run the test. And typically you do those things, just you have SQL statements that update the database, I'm not directly with SQL. I'll use WP CLI a lot. Um, I try not to do direct queries if I can help it. Thank you. Um, so my question is kind of related. It's sort of going beyond what you're doing here. So this is sort of like as you're testing everything for before you hand it off the client. So what we struggle with is um, when you hand a site off the site, you can decide say that you need to test on, you know, Apple iOS versus Windows and all the different browser types and we start talking about mobile and their eyes start to cross. And they don't necessarily have you know even access potentially to all of So what do you suggest sort of, is there a way to take some of these things and make it user friendly for non tech and your end users who are clients who could then test? Yes. Um you could, you're gonna have to put in more work, like I wrote a little note app that I wrote on the command line. You could probably write a more robust app with the GUI if you wanted to. Um, they're actually, I'm using you know, an open source project that, like a lot of things, you can do it yourself, but it takes time and energy, or there's services that your clients could sign up for, and they will do these visual tests for them, give them the nice UI, but they might have to pay, 10, I don't know, 10 bucks a month or something. Right, uh, those sorts of things. Um, if you do automate, like we saw all the tests run a, when a pull request is open, um, if you can build that into your project scope that we will set up these automated tests for you so that when we leave, you know, if you uh, run through this process, these things will still be tested. So you can write um, tests that do log into the admin. So uh, we're using Headless Chrome, and so you can actually authenticate with WordPress and log in. Um, in my case, I'm just testing the front end after plugin updates. Um, but you could definitely write tests. Actually, have a, one more example here. So uh, one of the links was to, um, in the resources, is to this repository that runs all the tests on pull requests. And I actually have um, BHAT running. Um, if you're not familiar with BHAT, it can help you with more of those business critical tests. So actually, let me see if I can find the stuff. Uh, and so, with, I'm actually testing the Give Donation plugin, um, and I'm doing that with BHAT, and so I have steps defined. Let's zoom in a bit. Um, so, things like log into the admin, go to the edit screen of my donation form, update some settings, change the donation level to 500, set it as the default, press publish, when I go to that form on the front end, uh, and I clear the cache, then the amount I updated in the back end should be visible. So you definitely can write tests that um, do those sorts of things. And I've seen tests being written like custom user roles and permissions in WordPress are something that is requested pretty frequently, but often it's hard to you know make sure those are working properly. You can write tests for things like that so that you know, this uh, role tries to go to view this page. I see access denied, or, you know, these sorts of things. So, um, visual regression, I, I said that's a good foundation, 
because just taking screenshots and comparing them is pretty just kind of set it and forget it. Uh, more of this sort of stuff you're talking about, you actually have to get your hands dirty and write these custom tests because they're bespoke for every project. Um, you know, this one, this one having a donation form, there might be another site with the Give plugin, but their donation form is probably set up completely differently, right? So, um, when you get into testing those more critical features, you have to spend more time to write tests custom to that project, but uh, it's definitely worth it to make sure you have that coverage.